praise God. This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And we are so happy, so happy to be gathered here together to worship our God and to thank Him for everything that He's done for us in, with, and through His Son, Jesus the Christ. And it's only because of what Jesus has done on the cross for us that we have this amazing relationship with God when we've been obedient to the call of the gospel, when we've heard the good news, when we believed it, when we repented of our sinful ways, when we've stopped trying to live life our way, and we've started doing it God's way, we confess Jesus as Lord and we get baptized into Christ. That means to be united with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. Last week we talked about the resurrection and all that it means, and it's the resurrection which is the foundation of everything that we believe. Because without the resurrection, everything that Jesus Christ did would be meaningless. And it means now that he has risen, and he's ascended to heaven, he sits at the right hand of God. Aren't we thankful for that? Amen. Are we thankful that Jesus is at the right hand of God? Amen. Are we thankful that he is there as our advocate talking to the Father on our behalf, claiming us as his own. What a blessing it is. Praise God. And we are here today because of us all worshiping God and being united as brothers and sisters in the blood of Christ. And we are, hey, you know what? One of the greatest things in the world is to be a Christian. And one of the greatest things in the world is to be part of the family of God. If you're in Jesus Christ, you are part of God's family. Look around. You got a whole bunch of brothers and sisters who love you, who care about you, who want to help you be everything that God wants you to be in his son Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why we're here. That's why we have joy. I hope that's why we're excited. That's why we're going to worship God together as a body of believers. Let's pray for a moment and then we'll begin our worship. Good morning, girl. Hi, Robin. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just love you so much. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for your love, your grace. Thank you for everything you've done for us in, with, and through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, even while we're sinners, you demonstrate your love for us in the fact that Christ died for us and did for us what we were unable to do for ourselves. And Father, that is what grace is all about. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that we received from you when we were baptized into Christ Jesus. And Father, as we talk today and study your word, we just ask you to help us to continue to yield to the Holy Spirit of God. We just ask you to help us please him, not grieve him. Father, yield to him. Live by his power that you place within us. Father, we thank you for the church. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the unity we have in Jesus, just like he has unity with you. And Father, we thank you for anybody who's here today. Father, we just ask you to bless this time. Let it be a time of blessing, a time of encouragement, a time of growth, a time of learning, a time of focus on you and you alone for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. If you're visiting with us today, we ask that you would take a moment to fill out one of these visitor cards that are in the pew in front of you. Just drop it into the offering plate when it comes along. We hope you're blessed by being here, and it's a blessing to us that you are with us today. Let's focus now on God and God alone. And worship him with all of our hearts. Pin number 535. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves you day. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way groweth clear. For I'm in the glory land way. List to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the glory land way. Wonders come home, oh, hasten to obey. For I'm in the glory land way. 
I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way grow clear for I'm in the glory land way. Onward I go rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way groweth clear for I'm in the glory land way. Hymn number 590. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day, without him I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go, no other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad, he's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, my friend in trial sore. I go to him for blessings and he gives them more and more. He sends the sunshine and the rain. He sends the harvest golden grain. Sunshine and rain, harvest of grain, he's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, I want no better friend. I trust him now, I trust him when life's fleeting day shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend, beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, eternal joy, he's my friend. Psalm before the scripture reading in the prayer, hymn number 108. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Keep silence. Keep silence. Silence me for him. Today's scripture reading is from Romans seven twenty one through twenty five. So I discover this principle: when I get to do what is good, evil is with me. For when I want to do what is good, evil is with me. For in my inner self I joyfully agree with God's law, but I see a different law in the parts of my body waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this dying body? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we'd like to thank you so much for allowing us to come together today to, to be with one another, Lord, to, to meet with your body and to worship you. Lord, we'd like to ask you watch over all those on the prayer list today, all those that are, all those that are struggling, all those that are sick. Lord, we ask you to watch over the families here, Lord, to, to help them keep you as the focus, to help keep you as number one, Lord, as, as they go through the daily struggles of life. Lord, we ask you to watch over the speaker of the hour. Please uh, bless Ian, Lord, to, for him to have a ready recollection of the things he had studied and to, to use the spirit that you've given us, Lord, to, to talk to us. And we ask you, Lord, as we hear it, to help us to receive it and help us to take it into our hearts so that we don't just think about it today, but 
think about it tomorrow and the next. And as we go through the daily struggles of life, Lord, to, to look to your word for our guidance and, and for our, our hope and for our strength. Lord, we'd like to thank you so much for, for being a God that you are, the, the loving, all-knowing, the one that, that cares for us and, and loves us and, and sent his son to die on the cross for us. Lord, we'd like to thank you for all the many blessings you have given us and especially for sending your son. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Seven hundred forty-four. We're part of the family that's been born again. Part of the family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved us and made us his own. Now we're part of the family that's on its way home. And sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry, sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven, God's family. When a brother meets sorrow, we all feel his grief. When he passed through the valley, we all feel relief together in sunshine, together in rain, together in victory, through his precious name. And sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry, sometimes we share together, heartaches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven, God's family. And though some go before us, we all meet again. Just inside the city, as we enter in, there'll be no more parting. With Jesus we'll see, together forever, God's family. And sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry, sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs, sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven. God's family. 725. This will be a song before we have the communion. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees. When I fall on my knees, with my face to the rising sun. O oh Lord, have mercy on me. Let us drink the cup together on our knees. Let us drink the cup together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my 
thy face to the rising sun. O Lord, have mercy on me. Let us praise God together on our knees. Let us praise God together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, O Lord, have mercy on me. Before we begin the communion, I'd like to extend a happy birthday to Manford, who was 88 yesterday. Three score and ten, plus some. Happy birthday, Manford. As we gather around the table, we think of God's love for us, and we read in John where God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What a sacrifice. He loves you and he loves me enough to do that. Then we should return the love. We're going to take of the bread, which is a symbol of, of his body that was hung on the cross, that was broken with the spear in his side, and the blood flowed freely from that. As we think back on this, let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee so much for your son who you sent to be our sacrifice for us. We appreciate the love that you have showed to us through him. May we be ever mindful of that and may we put the thoughts and cares of this earthly world aside as we reflect back on that as we partake of the bread. All these things we say in his name. Amen.
cup is a symbol of Christ's blood as we partake of it let's do so in a way that we will remember the sacrifice that he gave for us let us pray our father as we partake of the fruit of the vine may we think of all that you've done for us and how you've set an example for us to live by we pray that as we partake that we will do so in a manner that is well-pleasing to you. All these things we say in your son's name. Amen.
Psalm number 634. 634. This will be the psalm before we have Ian. As we stand, please. Hint, cut the next song. <laughs> oh, land of rest for thee, I sigh. When will the moment come? When I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace at home. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. To Jesus Christ I fled for rest. He bid me cease to roam and lean for succor on his rest till he conduct me home. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. I saw that once my Savior sighed, no more my steps shall roam. With him I'll brave death's chilling tide and reach my heavenly home. We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. Please be seated. We're continuing and nearing the end of our study in Galatians. If you have your Bibles, please open to Galatians chapter 5, and we'll have two more lessons after this lesson today. As you're turning there, let me just uh, say a few things to get us focused on the direction that we're going to be going. Throughout the Bible, we're provided accounts of conflict and war. And we see from the Bible, and we also know from personal experience, that people war against people and kings war against kings. But there's another aspect, unfortunately, that we also see in the Bible. And I believe this is an issue that really causes God deep pain and distress. Because in the Bible, what we see is Christians fighting and warring against other Christians. We have to realize that when these things happen, when we see Christians fighting and warring against Christians, the cause behind it is the flesh. James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 tells us of this. Let's look at this passage from James for a moment. James asks the question, and we have to remember that he's writing to people of faith here, Christians, children of God, and he asks, what is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from the cravings that are at war within you? You desire and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. And there's a war unlike any other war that every Christian, every true Christian, every genuine Christian is involved in. It's a spiritual war. And God has addressed its significance in many ways. It's a fact. Not my opinion. It's a fact. It's in Scripture. It's what God says. It's what we have to understand. It's what we have to believe. It's what we have to acknowledge. And it's what we are involved in every day of our Christian lives. And if you are not on board with that, I can tell you, you are already fading away and starting to lose the battle. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4 say this. 
For though we live in the body, we do not wage war in an unspiritual way. So that means it is spiritual. That's the very essence of what we're talking about, spiritual warfare. And he says in verse 4, since the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. We have weapons of God, from God, and for the glory of God to demolish the things that are of the world, from the world, due to the world. Paul also put it like this in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12, and I hope and I pray that as I'm saying these scriptures, I'm reciting these scriptures, that as we go through these, these are scriptures that you're already thinking about because you already know the word well enough to be going to the scriptures that deal with this very issue. That's the direction we all should be going as Christians. That we should be developing a pattern of having the Word of God written in our hearts. And that when we hear a certain subject, when a certain issue is called up, we immediately, immediately, without hesitation, start thinking about scriptures, verses, words of God that come to mind to fight against or to deal with the issue at hand. Brothers and sisters, this is critical. This is critical in this issue of spiritual warfare and is also critical in the issue of living lives that demonstrate the relationship that we have with God. Before other people. How important it is. Because out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And these words should just be flowing out, be brought to the forefront of our minds when we start talking about such critical issues. And I'm telling you, there is spiritual warfare. You know it. It's raging all around us. There's a fight going on. Satan is trying to steal souls away. He's trying to keep souls from coming to Christ. And the ones that are with Christ, he's trying to steal away. And he's trying to do it in so many different ways. And I can tell you right now, I am dealing with it. You're dealing with it. But the issue is marriage in the church is under attack in a way that I've never seen before. And we've got to be fighting against it. And it's terrible. Well, here's what Paul wrote in chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. He says, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the tactics of the devil. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. So today, brothers and sisters, church, we're going to be talking about understanding the basics of spiritual warfare. And in the first part of chapter 5, Paul addressed the issue of Christian liberty. He talked about not using Christian freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. In Galatians 5.13, this is what he wrote. For you were called to be free, brothers. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. And as we were talking about in our Bible class today, this is one of the most important verses in this letter that Paul writes to the church in Galatia. So significant. He makes this point, and now he moves into one of the most important aspects of Christianity, living under the power and in submission to the Holy Spirit of God. And Paul reaffirms that the choice is a personal one. This is a personal choice And the options are mutually exclusive. That means there are two different choices and you've got to pick one or the other because they are both in opposite direction. It's like they're polar opposites of each other. You can either do this or you can do this, but you cannot do both at the same time. That's what mutually exclusive means. In Galatians 5.18, he says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. 
and he will now write to help the Christians in Galatia understand what they are facing. He will provide an understanding of the basics of spiritual warfare in a way that they do not yet understand. And unfortunately, unfortunately, here's the sad part. A lot of Christians today in the church are fighting this issue of spiritual warfare. They're looking at it, they're facing it, but you know what? They don't have the correct understanding of what it's about, what they need to do, and how they need to be victorious. And that's why I'm preaching this lesson today, and it just so happens I'm following the book of Galatians, and I'm just going through the book, but brothers and sisters, you know, if you've been hearing me for the four years I've been here preaching, you know how serious I take this issue of spiritual warfare, and it is one of the most important things I consider myself given the privilege to preach on and about. Because it's everywhere. And it's affecting so many people. And it's doing so much damage inside and outside of the church because people, even Christians, even God-fearing, God-loving people are not equipping themselves in the right way to be effective in this battle. And how critical it is. How critical it is. He's going to provide an understanding of the basics of spiritual warfare, and it's something that they and Christians everywhere around the world need to understand. Let's just think of this for a moment. Refusal, refusal to give spiritual warfare a proper consideration is three things. It's foolish, it's dangerous, and it's deadly. Let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26, and see what Paul has to say about this issue. He says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the spirit, and the spirit desires what is against the flesh. Now look at this. They are opposed to each other. They are opposed to each other. That is a struggle. That is a conflict. And he says that. They are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. When we talk about conflict, we are talking about a power struggle over differences. And this issue... This issue is conflict. It's a power struggle. It's the power of God and good against the power of Satan and evil in us, over us, about us, and about everybody else in the world who has not yet come to Christ. Verse 16, excuse me, 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And he says, now the works of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar, some translations say, and the like, meaning that he could go on and on and on with such a list. Because the list of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, are almost endless, and how terrible they are. He says, I tell you about these things in advance, as I told you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, it's, un- it's a very important thing to understand the point that Paul is making here, and what he's saying is, hey, he's not talking about a Christian who has a temporary lapse from time to time, who knows better, who lives by the Spirit, but who falls short from now and time and time again for a brief period and gets back up and starts doing the right thing. But rather, he's talking about somebody who lives a certain way, who practices a certain lifestyle, who does not care about changing in spite of the fact that this is what God says. That's what he's dealing with. That's what he's talking about. And he says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Verse 24, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh 
with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, we must also follow the Spirit. We must not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. We could go on and talk for hours on this issue of spiritual warfare, and in a way, it's so important that we should be spending hours on it. But for this hour, I'm going to focus on three critical aspects of spiritual warfare that I want you to come away with and understand. Number one, the conflict between the flesh and the spirit must be properly understood. Point number one, the conflict between the flesh and the spirit must be properly understood. When we're talking about the flesh, it comes from a Greek word meaning sarks. It's all the evil that men are and are capable of, apart from the grace of God. And it goes along with the whole issue of the way we were before we were born again of God's spirit. It's referring back to the natural man or to the old man, the way we were before we became Christians. And you know what that verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, right? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature. The old has gone, the new has come. When we're talking about the flesh, we're talking about going back to focusing on, concentrating on, and giving into everything that we were before we became Christians. Because that's all we had. And we must realize that we have evil desires within us. And these evil desires scream out to be satisfied. And Satan will use these desires to incite and energize us to go against the Holy Spirit of God. To go against the Holy Spirit of God is to sin against God. Do we realize that? Do we acknowledge that? Do we agree that to go in violation or go against the Holy Spirit of God is to sin against God? I hope we can say that. And the conflict is real. It's very real. And the more we understand it, the more power we have in the conflict. Here's something to think about. Denying that the conflict exists does not help any of us. Being transparent about the conflict, you know what that does? That helps all of us. And that's what Paul is doing here. He's being open and honest about the conflict between the flesh and the spirit, and he knows it well. He knows the issues. He's faced the struggles. He's dealt with this issue of sin. He knows how often his body wants to do the things that it shouldn't do and how often he should be doing the things he should be doing. If you know Romans, if you know your word, if you know the scripture and you know what Paul wrote about in Romans and you know Romans chapter 7, he deals with the issue. And he deals with it here. And in Galatians 5, 17, he says, For the flesh desires what is against the spirit, and the spirit desires what is against, what is against the flesh. They are opposed to each other. Now look at this, so that you don't do what you want. The presence of the conflict proves that we have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The presence of a conflict that validates that we know we're supposed to be doing what God wants, what the Holy Spirit of God wants, but we are fighting against the flesh, and God gave us his Holy Spirit to keep us from doing what we want to do and to, keep, and to, to help us do what he wants us to do, what we should be doing as children of God, as believers in Jesus Christ, as people who have been born again of God's Spirit. Man, you got to ask yourself then, what if I'm not feeling a conflict? What could that mean? Well, that's a very good question. Because it could mean a couple of really bad things. It could mean you think you have the Holy Spirit of God when, in fact, you don't have the Holy Spirit of God. Or it could mean you're giving in to the desires of the flesh without even knowing it. Either way you look at it, it's not good. The conflict is real. The conflict should be there. The conflict should be felt by every person because we still have 
the human part of us. We still have the flesh, but we also, as Christians, have the Holy Spirit of God. And there is this conflict inside us all the time. Maybe we're not feeling it with the same intensity as we, we do in different times, but if there's no conflict there, something's not quite right. And the potential of the flesh should not be underestimated. The Apostle Peter addressed it too, and here's how he put it, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, and he says this, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and temporary residents to abstain from fleshly desires that war against you. Can I make it any clearer? Can God make it any clearer that there is this battle going on between the flesh and the spirit all the time? It doesn't take a break. It just doesn't. That's why we need the Holy Spirit in us all the time. And we know we only get that from God after we've heard the gospel, believed the gospel, repented, confessed, and been baptized into Christ Jesus, right? That's what the scripture says. Not my opinion. Fact from the word of God, from God himself. But the conflict is not limited merely to the flesh. The conflict involves the focus of the mind. Again, let's go to writings of Paul. Here's what Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and he says this. So if you have been raised with the Messiah, seek what is above, where the Messiah is, seated at the right hand of God. And he says this. Look at this. Set your minds. Set your minds on what is above, not on what is on the earth. Now let's think about this for a moment. Let's get really practical in terms of the way we live our lives. And we set all kinds of things. We set alarm clocks. We set DVRs. We set personal electronic devices to do all kinds of things that are important for us, for shows that we don't want to miss. Hey, I knew that. I do that too. But what's the most important thing? Setting our mind on things above. And what if we did that? What if we did that as much as we did some of this other stuff? What if we set our minds daily on things above, on godly things, on things that really matter? What a difference it would make. What a difference it would make. All right, point number two. We must understand the distinction between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And here, we are given the indicators of our hearts and minds. And we see that Paul makes note that Christians understand the difference. We know the difference. We know, why do we know the difference? Because we've been given the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit of God within us. Not knowing is not the issue. I say that over and over again. Not knowing is not the issue. Doing is the issue. Doing is the issue. And he writes here in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. And look what he says. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. And he's saying it's obvious because we know we have the Holy Spirit. And not only that, it's obvious because of the origin of which it comes from. It's obvious because it's not coming from God. It's obvious because it's coming from the flesh. It's obvious because it's being incited by the enemy of God. These things have nothing to do with the nature, the characteristics, and the attributes of God. That's why they're obvious. <laughs> Look what he says. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. It's obvious that these kinds of things have no place in the life of a Christian. Right? No place in the life of a Christian, no place in the thought of a Christian, no place in the behavior of a Christian, no place even in the desire of a Christian. The desire, every one of these things, comes from the flesh. And it's interesting, when we look at these things, these issues, these sins, are broken down into four groups, four specific groups of sins that Paul is identifying here. And he starts with 
sexuality. And I believe he starts with sexuality because of the power that it has. Satan has taken a, the most beautiful gift that God has given us, one of the most beautiful gifts of sex to be shared and enjoyed between one man and one woman who are married in the sight of God. And I say that specifically because I don't care what man says, what civil laws they come up with. God gives the definition of what marriage is, what it's all about, and what it means. And it's only in his context that the issue of sex is to be enjoyed in a couple married in the eyes of God. And how powerful it is in the hands of the enemy. So he talks about three issues that deal with sexual immorality. Then he deals with two issues of religion. Then he deals with human behavior. <laughs> how we treat each other and our relationship with God. And then he deals with two pagan sins, drunkenness and carousing. And we've got to ask ourselves and examine our hearts. And think about where are our desires? And what are we willing to do to change the desires of our hearts, to fight through the desires of the flesh and yield to the Holy Spirit of God within us? And then he turns to Galatians 5, 22 and 23 and addresses the things of God. And he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control, and we see here three different groups of Christ-like attitudes. Number one, the Christian state of mind, the kind of mind that we should be having, which is the mind of Christ, because as Christians, that's what we have. That's what Scripture says. We have the mind of Christ. These are the kinds of things we should be focusing on. And he talks about behavior and the way we should be treating other people. With patience, with kindness, with goodness, with faith. It's all about relationship. That's nothing new. That's what Jesus said from the very beginning, that people will know that we're his disciples by the way we love one another. That's at the very heart of what he's talking about. And if we have the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, and the, spirit is, the fruit of the Spirit is evident in our lives, we're going to treat each other different than other people treat each other. We're going to treat each other different once we become Christians than the way we did before we became Christians. And then finally, in the third grouping, he talks about how the Christian is in himself. There's going to be a gentleness about you. There's going to be self-control about you. And it's going to be evident to other people and to God. And I could go on and on. I just want to mention a few things here. The love he's talking about, that's the agape kind of love. That's the self-sacrificing love. That's the love that is born out of choice, whether somebody deserves to be loved or not, the way God loved us and gave us his son even while we were sinners. There's joy. That's an inward state of joy, regardless of, out the, regardless of the outward circumstances in which we find ourselves, regardless of our financial situation, regardless of our health regardless of who likes us, regardless of who doesn't like us, we have joy in our hearts because we know we belong to God. We know we've been saved with God. We know we're right with God. We know we have forgiveness of sins. That's the kind of joy that nobody can change when you really have that. When you really have that. Peace. He's talking about the peace that we have in our relationship with God and the peace that we have in our relationships with each other. 
patience? Are we tolerant with one another? Not tolerant in the way the world thinks about it, tolerant in terms of accepting what other people believe, whether you believe in it or not, but are, are we patient with each other in our idiosyncrasies, in our faults, in our shortcomings? That's the kind of patience he's talking about here. Kindness, are we thoughtful towards one another? Do we do nice things for each other, whether we deserve it or not? Not because of what we've done for each other, but because of what Christ has done for us. Are we thoughtful? Goodness. Are we generous with each other? Do we go out of our way to do other things for other people just because we want to? Faithfulness. Are we reliable? Are we true to God? Are we there for God even when things don't go our way? Do we cling to our faith? Are we steadfast? Do we continue to believe in him? Gentleness is meekness, and meekness is strength under control. Self-control. Do we rely on, do we know, do we count on the victory that we have in Christ, in Christ alone, over the desires of the flesh? And finally, point number three, and we'll end here. Remember this. Think of this. Write this into your hearts and into your minds and into your lives. Spiritual warfare is an active not a passive process. Spiritual warfare is an active, not a passive process. If you are thinking that the Holy Spirit of God is just going to carry you along and do, have you do all the right things without you having to do anything at all, you are way off track. This is not a thing where you just get in the plane. We've got a pilot here. Okay, we almost have a pilot here. This is not a situation where you get in the plane and you flip the switch on the autopilot and you just sit back and relax and let the Holy Spirit do its thing. It's an active process. We have got to be involved in working with, yielding to, giving ourselves over, studying scriptures, knowing the word of God, and fighting through the desires of the flesh to yield to the Holy Spirit of God, which we have within us in accordance with his word, his promise, when we were obedient to the call of the gospel and we got baptized into Christ. We must strive. And here's what Paul wrote, Galatians 5.16, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And we must be constantly depending upon that Holy Spirit of God, listening to him, yielding to him, not grieving him, and growing the Spirit of God within us. We must strive to walk and live by the Spirit of God. It is possible, or God would not have said so. God is not a liar. God does not tell us to do things that we cannot do. And as we mature and grow in faith, we'll get better at denying the flesh and walking in the spirit. That's a fact. That you can count on. I can attest to that. I hope you can attest to that. And that is the testimony that we have to offer to the whole world because I can tell you this, and we know this, we talk about it all the time, one of the toughest things for people to realize and understand about giving themselves over to Christ which they can't get at times, which they fail to understand, is that all the things that they do, all the sins they commit, all the desires of the flesh that they have, they think they're going to have to overcome that by themselves. And we have to help them understand, you won't. In fact, you can't. That's why God is going to give you his spirit when you obey his call and get right with him. He's going to give you his spirit to help you do the things you need to do and to stop doing the things you shouldn't do. He will not leave you alone. And we won't either. <laughs> We're going to be there. We're going to be with you, encouraging you, helping you, leading, counseling, guiding. But you have to do your part. Isn't it sad when we know if everybody who's been baptized into Christ were here today, we wouldn't have enough seating capacity, would we? There'd be standing room only. People would be lining up around the walls here, right? But we cannot go and force people to come to church. We cannot go and force people to do what they're supposed to do. I cannot go and drag every person who has been baptized into Christ here on Sunday morning for Bible study, for worship service, for Wednesday night, whatever the case may be. They have to want it. 
And when they don't want it, you know what they want? They want the desires of the flesh over the desires of the Holy Spirit. That's the battle we're talking about. And it's serious. Well, maybe the problem is we spend more time catering to the flesh than we do the Spirit of God. And maybe the problem is that we desire, we devise, and I know we all do this to some degree. I feel it too. I'm stuck in this struggle as much as any of you. I am no different. And it's hard. I know how hard it is. Sometimes it's agonizing, and sometimes it it drives me to my knees, and sometimes there are tears that are shed, and I shed them with you. In many cases, when you're in my office with me and we are talking about these things, and we're talking about the struggles that's going on, and the battles that are being waged, and the fights that we're against, and we shed tears together because it hurts and it stinks, but we got to fight through it. And we have the Holy Spirit of God, and we have each other to help us be victorious over the work that the enemy is trying to do. But sometimes, and in some cases, maybe we make justifications for yielding to the flesh rather than fighting through and being obedient to the Spirit of God. Galatians 5, here's where we conclude. Galatians 5, 25 through 26. Since we live by the Spirit, we must also follow the Spirit. We must not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another, it's a very interesting statement that he makes here. And this is one of the aspects of the flesh. There is going to be a desire. A desire. There's going to be temptations that Satan puts before us to try to make us feel like we are better than other people, better than other Christians because of the way we do things versus the way they do things. And he is warning against that. Do not let that happen. Do not turn on each other. Remain united. The battle is not against each other. The battle is against the enemy. The battle is against Satan. We are not here to fight each other. We are here to help each other in the battle with Christ against the enemy. And he's warning against having this bad attitude that comes from the desire of the flesh to make you feel better about yourself and what you're doing, comparing yourself to another person who's also a Christian. And he warns about doing that. And he knows what happens. That people who typically do this, people who typically criticize and attack other Christians, are typically consumed and involved in worthless struggle. And the enemy has them deviated off track, deviated off course, and what they're supposed to be all about, which is serving Christ and Christ alone and comparing themselves to Christ and Christ alone. But it all starts with that first step. If you're here today and you've never taken that step and you want to, you want to be forgiven of your sins, you want to be baptized into Christ, or if there's any other need you have, please come forward as we stand and sing.
Good morning. A few announcements to go over before we leave here. Happening today, uh, area-wide singing at Salisbury Church of Christ. I don't know if the joy bus is going or not, but I would think it might be. Mm-hmm. Um, May 5th is the men's breakfast. That's the first Saturday of each month, and that happens every first Saturday of the month. Um, a big thanks to all who contributed candy for the Easter egg hunt. It was a huge success. Next Saturday, we're having a yard sale for the youth. If you haven't donated anything, you have this week to do the, get that done. Uh, we're going to start around 7 a.m. in the Family Life Center. Also, two weeks from this, from yesterday, April the 28th, we're having the spring cleanup, and there is a sign-up sheet on the back, so you can sign up for a task you would like to do. If you don't sign up for a task you would like to do, you get whatever's left over. Uh, exactly. Um, there are several other things on the bulletin that uh, are coming up in the future. May 19th, there are two ladies' days, one in Dover and one in Philadelphia. And June 22nd through the 24th is the Mid-Atlantic Church of Christ Lectures in Westminster, Maryland. I was asked, and it's been mentioned already, to say something about Manford's birthday. And the uh, past few weeks, I have been uh, contacted by a lot, and Joshua and I would like to thank those who have said prayers and written letters for the scholarship. He was not awarded the full scholarship. He did receive um, a half scholarship. <coughs> so <coughs> that is good. <coughs> is there anything else at this time that needs to be made? According to Monty Cox, when he was where you paid for eight years. <laughs> Anything else at this time? All right, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and this time we have to gather as brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for that bond we have together. And we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that makes that possible. We pray that you be with us through this week, that we take the word that has been presented to us today and that we can apply it in our lives, not only this week, but for a lifetime, dear Lord. We thank you for Ian and the message that he gives us each week, and we thank you for the passion that he speaks with. We pray that you be with those who are on the prayer list, those who are struggling through family issues and those who are struggling with physical illness, dear Lord. And we also at this time pray that you be with those members that are not here today, whether they are at college or living at another location, dear Lord. We just pray that you be with them and that your love fills the void that they have being away from us and that brothers and sisters that are around them can help fill that void as well. We thank you for this beautiful day you've given to us, and we just pray that we can extend your glory and honor to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>